We spent much of the course since it's been online looking at how to analyze data and apply models to it uh, from simple to more complex models. When you get data, you've got to fit it to something that makes biological sense. Our very last assay that we're going to do virtually uh, is called an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or an ELISA. Uh, I one at once asked the head, sort of someone that looked for students seeking jobs in industry, the skills that our students would need. I think I mentioned this before. He said understanding ELISAs is one of them. So I want to briefly describe an ELISA and then walk through about how one gets the data, which is represented in this plate, and then how to analyze it. Uh, these are incredibly sensitive assays, and they're used for serological detection, for instance, of, of COVID antibodies, uh, if you've been exposed to COVID. So for instance, what you do is, uh, typically it's done in a 96 wall plate. You adsorb to the plate something of interest called an antigen. An antigen typically is a protein, could be some species to which an antibody has been made or redirected. So this could, for instance, be the COVID virus right here, or the spike protein, which is from the surface of the COVID virus. Uh, and if you put this on the, you know, the plate, which is composed of um, poly polycarbonate polystyrene, it adsorbs somehow irreversibly. Then what you can do is, let's say you have an antibody uh, to this particular protein. What you can do is, and let's say it's in your serum, in your serum, you've been exposed to COVID, uh, you can add a sample of that to it uh, and it will bind to it. But then, you know, our goal is to detect it, to detect the, basically, if you have antibody, just because the antibody that you have in your serum to the COVID protein is there, we still haven't detected it yet. So we can do it if this antibody that we put in has been linked to an enzyme that can react with the substrate to produce some kind of color, like a yellow color, like maybe perinitrophenol. Uh, but that's not the case for the assays that we would do for COVID. That's called a direct ELISA. And then you can quantitate the amount of yellow color generated. The more antibody you have in the sample that's applied to the coated well, the greater the yellow color. Now, you can do something more indirect, and this is what the COVID assay would be. You put a COVID protein or the COVID uh, virus, adsorb it irreversibly to a plate. Well, most likely it would just be the spike protein, the not infectious. Then you would add antibody from patients that might have it or controls. The antibody is represented as this Y. The ends of the Y bind the antigen on the plate. Then what you would do, you still can't detect it. You would add a second antibody that recognizes the distal end of, this of, of the patient antibody. And that second antibody is conjugated to an enzyme so that when you throw in the substrate, this sort of complex will generate a color. And that's typically what's done if you're looking for antibody present in a serological sample, for instance. It's called an indirect because it's this added antibody that's required. Now you can see I have wells, some, there's standards. There's typically blanks that are run in which basically no serum sample or control is added. If that were the case, no antibody would bind, and then no secondary antibody would bind, and hence you get no color generation when you added the substrate. Then you add a whole series, typically in triplicate, of standards. Uh, these are triplicates running across here. Uh, you can tell this produces the most yellow color. So it was probably you added a sample, a standard that had antibody in it of the highest concentration. Uh, and then ultimately, when you add the second antibody, you produce the most color. Then you would make dilutions of that standard, like you would do in any analytical chemistry class, uh, to make standard curve. And so this is the most concentrated standard, then next least the most concentrated, and this keeps going down until by the end, you have very little of the antibody present in the dilution, and hence very little color. So the question is, how do we quantitate this mathematically. What's the mathematical model that can explain this binding event? And how do we analyze the data? The data will be absorption values on the y-axis somehow versus the amount of antibody in our sample, which would be on the x-axis. So it's a simple dose-response curve that you've studied a lot. Now, 
This slide shows two possible dose responses. Let's say this is the increase in amount of serum containing an antibody, and this could be the absorption in the, well, in the wells in the plate. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. Well, we might get a response that looks like this, and we've seen this oftentimes, and you've graphed this many times, or we might get a response that looks like this. So if this, let's say the data fell like this on a line, we could obviously draw a line through this. My question is to you, and you can fit this data. So the best fit for this, what kind of curve would it be? And I think, of course, if the data points were scattered around here, you would say a line. But then the question is, so there is a mathematical form of the straight line. How many parameters or constants are needed to describe this line? Uh, and, you know, parameters, maybe it's a term you're not used to, but you know the word constants, and you've seen this over and over again since you were a wee tyke. So obviously for here, we could, the equation of a straight line is y equals mx. So now if I ask you how many parameters are needed to describe this line, I think you should say, well, this is the independent variable x, the dependent variable y, the two parameters, there's two, slope and y-intercept. So if I know this and I know the slope, I can draw this line. But, you know, binding data doesn't look like that unless you use a limited range of, let's say, the ligand concentration if you're binding to a macromolecule. This is a more likely response if you vary the ligand. And we're going to call this variable x over a very large range. This is the y variable, and it can be the concentration in the plate of the yellow colors, the yellow mono yellow color. So my question is here, how many variables would we need to actually... Uh, describe this equation? That's an interesting question, and we're going to get to it at the end of the slide. I, I imagine you could imagine some intercepts and slopes, but it's more complicated than that. It turns out we need four variables, four, not variables, constant, four parameters, uh, and we'll see that. In well, actually, let's talk about it now. Uh, I just put the same sort of sigmoidal plot here, and there's a signal here, and there's some kind of x value here. It turns out there's four parameters you need to describe this. There is a minimal signal at low concentration. Uh, remember, there was hardly any yellow color. Now, if you put enough in, eventually you get to the point where you can't get any more. There's going to be a maximal signal. That's maximal. So that's parameter D. We'll call the minimal signal A. And then there's this curve linear plot. Now, if you think about it, there's an inflection point right here. And it turns out it's halfway up. And then the slope of this line at halfway up is yet another parameter. Uh, we can call that, and we'll call that the hill coefficient. We'll describe that in a second. It's the slope of this line when you get halfway up from the minimal signal to the maximal signal. And finally, the other parameter is this point right here. It is the x concentration where you get the half maximal signal. So we're going to fit the data, because in our data, it's we don't really know, the best thing we know we can measure is absorption. And it's either going to be, we're going to start with a minimal, we're going to end up with a maximal, and then we're going to get some kind of curve and we can fit it with these four variables. Now, the thing is, you never really know what the max signal is. A blank could be pretty easy, but you would have to add a lot and a lot of some sample X to ligand to actually uh, maximize the signal. But you don't have to get all the way up there if you fit the data, the data might only, let's say, fall in this region, but if you fit the equation that we're going to derive, essentially, with a four-parameter fit, uh, then you don't need to necessarily know the actual maximal of the signal, uh, which is really hard to achieve in any kind of binding assay. The minimal one is usually pretty easy to achieve. Okay, so uh, this video ends now, and then I'm going to talk about the mathematical analysis of these curves.